Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Jesse Hawthorne Fix. Uh, you are here for a special Spike Lee weekend. Um, and it's part of a film series called Midnights for Maniacs, which is celebrating its 15th year here in San Francisco. Um, uh, the series was started back at the Four Star, which is still open. Um, and the idea of this series was to celebrate underrated, dismissed, or overlooked films. And uh, I can tell you that about two to two and a half years ago, I imagined this weekend. Uh, it's very important that it actually happened, because we're celebrating Spike Lee's 60th birthday. Um, yeah, you should give that up for Spike Lee. What the hell? Because he carries... He carries the weight of the world um, on every single project that he does. And um, having programmed for 15 years, I can tell you that it is not easy to get any Spike Lee films played. Um, I'm not sure why that is. We can discuss that this weekend. Perhaps you uh, have some theories. Um, but I know that I grew up with his movies. He's been making films now for 30 years and um, he never stops. And sometimes he'll make two or three movies in one year, and perhaps there's a certain time period that you fell into of watching those movies, but then he'll keep making them past that. And uh, what we get to start off with tonight is Do the Right Thing. And I'm very interested in any of you who've never seen this film to raise your hand proudly. Uh, great. So that means the rest of you, how many of you have seen Do the Right Thing in a movie theater? So, uh, what city did you see it in? Austin. Austin? Seattle. Seattle? Arcata. Arcata? Here. San Francisco. What theater in San Francisco? Uh, the, uh, Kabuki. Kabuki Theater? Uh, it's interesting to think about Spike Lee working within the mainstream. Um, in most of his movies he's had to somehow create independently and market it to the studio and do the right thing was the movie that made him famous when it premiered at the Cannes Film Festival. This has always been a legend, legendary screening. Uh, in my memory, I was not there. But uh, Fist Fights erupted in the Cannes Film Festival, which is the premier film festival around the world. Uh, due to how uh, compl complicated and complex this film is, that some people will react in one way, and you'll be sitting next to somebody who will be feeling the exact opposite. And uh, because of Do the Right Thing and movies like that followed, and New Jack City, um, in fact, many movies made by black filmmakers or bla about black subjects uh, started to get released on Wednesdays instead of Fridays. And it's sort of an uncharted history that I'm very curious and interested in if any of you would like to follow up on this. Um, is somehow trying to diffuse the confusion in audiences. Um, following this movie, we're watching a movie called Crooklyn, and I would really like to emphasize those of you who think you're just coming for one movie tonight, uh, for you to stick around. Like I said, these movies don't play on the big screen, and specifically with uh, Crooklyn and tomorrow's movies, Malcolm X and Bamboozled, they, um, they do not play at all, much less in 35 millimeter. Uh, so, if you could, can you give it up to our projectionist who's projecting tonight? <laughs> the Roxy is the oldest movie theater in San Francisco. And uh, it's hard to keep movie theaters open. Uh, those of you who've seen Do the Right Thing, I'm sure you own it. Or perhaps um, you've seen it enough that you don't want to go out and spend the money and you had to buy food. and. Uh, creating a community in nonprofit theater is very special, and it means a lot to me. I know it's easier to just stay at home. I think Do the Right Thing plays on television this week. Uh, but this is going to be very special because I've tried to collect as many trailers of Spike Lee movies before each screening. If you come to all four of them, you will watch his entire career. Uh, and. What's so unique about Do the Right Thing is that every single actor in this movie was given a, an opportunity and a chance to create their own character. And that's very different than most movies, not just in Hollywood, but even in the independent world. 
And I want to stress this, I don't spoil anything in movies, so you don't have to worry about any plot issues. But I do, I want to talk about a couple of the actors, uh, because one, Spike Lee, he acts in this movie, and uh, I think people often forget how funny and uh, complex his characters are. Uh, one reason why I've had some difficulties trying to program Spike Lee is that straight up people just think that he makes movies that are uh, Black Lives Matter. And for some reason that's a negative. And uh, this is even not just the case of one dimensional filmmaking. You're going to see that we have so many different perspectives in this film that uh, I think Do the Right Thing is then even more progressive for where we are now almost 30 years after it was made. Uh, outside of Spike Lee being in the movie, you're going to see tons of actors who become famous later. Uh, we don't want to spoil too many of those. But uh, two old-timer actors that were married in this movie uh, are Ozzie Davis and Ruby Dee. Can we give it up for these two? <laughs> now, outside of just being funny and uh, quite um, controversial, uh, Spike Lee is a teacher. And he's teaching you not just cinema history, but uh, black film history. And these two actors, uh, I'd, be, I'd love to know a movie that Ozzy Davis directed. Oh, it does. Oh, God. Wasn't it nice? <laughs> <laughs> no, he directed movies out of the door, did Because Ozzy Davis is one of the original uh, black filmmakers who were given a very small amount of money from Hollywood to make uh, black exploitation films, right alongside Melvin Van oh, Peebles. Tomorrow. Cotton comes to Harlem, wonderful. Um, seeing Ozzie Davis in this film and then thinking about his character, it is Spike Lee looking back on that film history. Ruby Dee, by any chance, do you know what movie she was and play she was uh, quite known for? Raisin in the Sun, beautiful. Um, now, we can have old timer actors like this, we can have contemporary actors, and then even the side characters, I want you to pay attention to this. I teach Do the Right Thing in my film history class for 11 years. And um, whomever you decide to emphasize when you watch it, they go through a full three-dimensional character arc. It's mind-blowing. And uh, one character I'd love to emphasize is Steve Park. Uh, he's a Korean actor. Yeah, just give it up because you don't even know who he is, right? <laughs> Steve Park is one of those underrated and overlooked character actors. Uh, and for Asian Americans, and if you've studied any, any Asian American characters in movies, they're often a joke. And when Asian American play characters that have broken English, it's often for a joke. And Steve Park, he'll pop up in a couple of Coen Brothers movies. In fact, he's a key ingredient in a movie called Fargo. Um, every one of these people in this film, I think, has a chance to somehow open our eyes to something. And um, with that, uh, Ernest Dickerson, the cinematographer, is also someone that, don't just pay attention to the characters, but I'd love for you to look in the foreground, in the background, and really study the mise-en-scene. It's not just weird camera angles or creativity and with its color use, but it's also uh, just a fascinating journey when you're bored or listening to Sweet Dick Willie. Look up in the right hand and left hand corners and think about uh, how he's playing, Ernest Dickerson and Spike Lee is playing around with those contrasts. Um, now outside of Spike Lee this weekend, as I said, we'll see a couple trailers for tomorrow, which is Malcolm X and Bamboozled. Um, well, also Midnight's for Maniacs has a couple of programs coming up in April and May, and I'd love for you to um, try and, you know, block out a night and stroll on down into here to the Roxy, playing a movie called Bring It On. Uh -huh. yeah. You need a few more years to realize that this is a truly brilliant studio teen teenager movie that uh, confronts race and gender as well as a queer positive story from the early 2000s that is very rare. Um, and in May, doing a tribute to Twin Peaks, uh, showing uh, Blue Velvet by David Lynch and also a, a film called Peyton Place from 1957, it's 60th anniversary. Um, coming back to Spike Lee here, I would really like to emphasize he's one of the greatest living directors. And people don't understand that yet. We'll be looking back on his movies. I see him as a modern day Charlie Chaplin. He started off making very humorous stories 
In this case, it was for Nike ads, and he has just truly paved roads politically, socially, and uh, in all in all manners. I really am so happy you guys came out tonight. Please make sure to tell turn your cell phones off. Uh, my name is Jesse Alvinbig. This is Midnight for Maniacs. Okay, so we are going to have about a 10 minute break. Uh, we'll start Crooklyn at 9.35. But if you could, over break, the question that we're going to start off with is, did Mookie do the right thing? If you could think about that, uh, maybe we have some uh, theories when you come back. Have a wonderful break. In my way to be free All right, welcome back, everyone. Can give it up for Do the Right Thing. Now, as I said, I've been teaching the movie for 11 years, uh, and every, every semester that we watch it, it somehow feels like it's the most relevant movie. And um, I'm sure that some of you at least felt that watching it today. Um, but something that we talk about in class as something I'd like to do, because knowing that at the Cannes Film Festival people got into fist fights at the end of this movie um, is a real tribute to Spike Lee, because not only did he write and direct it, but he's also this main star. And I, I brought this question up of, did Mookie do the right thing? And seeing the stereotype or... Who you ask. What? It depends on who you ask. Exactly, right? It depends on how you want to look at Mookie. <laughs> is that a lot of us we relate to Mookie because this is what we're like at our job. If you could time how much you are on the internet when you're at work, and you should be working, perhaps. If you time how much you would rather be at home than be at work, you can start to relate not just to Mookie, but to this type. And Spike Lee, he's bringing up, this is an old-fashioned stereotype, this uh, lazy, uh, this uh, slacker that often we saw this in Hollywood films for our black characters and some of these actors Step and Fetch It and Willie Best they did wonderful jobs at being that stereotype but that's all they got to do and so I'd like to pose this question here uh, did Mookie do the right thing? why? Fuck you, dude. Awareness is good. Awareness is good for Mookie. That's good, right? I mean, he's a young person. Right? So at some point, some of us in this room, we grew up. So don't just take that for granted. At some point, you transitioned. And perhaps Mookie did the right thing because he's not acting stupid. He's throwing that garbage can into the window so that they don't fucking kill Sal. Maybe he's smart enough to see that they have to take their anger out on something. Now Spike Lee's movies are much more complicated than just blacks and whites hating each other. Every actor got to create their character. Sal, Danny Aiello, he fleshed that out into a three-dimensional character. He could have just been a bad guy. In fact, a lot of us feel quite betrayed what Mookie did because he's not looking at the individual anymore. This is a fascinating film that grows every time you watch it. 
And I'm sure that you were paying attention to some of the camera work, how there's always characters in the background, in the foreground. He's got a real world that he created here, a real day in the life. Yeah, maybe Mookie felt betrayed too. A minute ago, he says, I'll always think of you as a son, and then he starts using those horrible words. Okay. Great. And that conflict, it, it arises in all of us. Everything's perfect when things are going smooth. All it takes, right, is one little conflict. I mean, we heard bugging out, call him a guinea. And a lot of us, we like to, to root for the underdog. But then often that overdog becomes an underdog. And it depends on how you change your perspective here. Every character got a voice. Now, as Do the Right Thing is coming up on its 30th anniversary, it's really important to me to look back on all these Spike Lee films because, as I said, this isn't just a black filmmaker trying to make black people look better than they have in previous films and history. He's actually creating a new complicated type of cinema that often we celebrate. For some reason, his movies keep going under radar. Now he makes this movie called Crooklyn just a few years later, in fact the movie after Malcolm X, because these movies they can get pretty heated. And Crooklyn is going to be his uh, coming of age, his autobiography growing up with his siblings in the 1970s. And like we saw with Do the Right Thing, these movies are fun, they're humorous, they're nostalgic, they, they tap into a time capsule, and at the same time it will transcend that genre. So I really hope that you can stick around for this entire movie here. I know it's late, it's a Saturday night, I don't know where else you would rather be than the oldest movie theater in San Francisco. Can we give it up for our cinema projectionist right here? Who has built up a handful of Spike Lee trailers, because hopefully you're going to want to watch some of his more uh, underseen movies. Now tomorrow at 4 o'clock is Malcolm X in 35mm. It is 10 reels long, 3 hours and 30 minutes. And this movie does not play. It is celebrating its 25th anniversary. And I have not seen it booked anywhere yet. And I really stress to you, we have people who are driving up from Los Angeles to see this double bill tomorrow. Don't miss it. 4 o'clock. Followed by the trailer you saw, Bamboozled. Which, in my opinion, Bamboozled is one of the most underrated films, American satires, of the 21st century. So I'd love for you to try and be on the cusp of this. And I gave you a ticket stub. I'd love you to pull this ticket stub out. It's homemade. And I appreciate that because, you know, my parents, they taught me how to make things. Yeah. I hand cut it. I hand numbered it. It's called craftsmanship. Thank you. Now there are a couple of dads in this room. There are a couple of dads in this room, including my own father, who flew out here from Montana to watch this festival. This and these ticket stubs are something that you could save to remember it. Remember the screening. Remember, hopefully, some very um, respectful audience members. Are you listening? Yes. Thank you. So I'd love number 38 to come on up. Is number 38 here? We've got number 38. Hey, there you are. Come on down. Come on down. Beautiful. Look at 38. Now what I'd like to give you is this thing called a CD. <laughs> you still have a CD player? Yes. This is a soundtrack to Crooklyn right here. Yeah. here we go. <laughs> and then I'd love number uh, 61. 61 here? Oh, it's so close, huh? Okay, I'm gonna have to kick you out if you don't stop. Me? Yeah. And me. Yeah. And me. So Just calm down. Okay? I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to be Great. I didn't have Is number 61 here? <laughs> All right, let's do. Uh... You know, Jose, come on down. Come on down. I love it. 
Jose wants the CD. And I'd love for you to give Jose a, uh, a hand here because he comes out to the Roxy Theater like every single night of the year. Now again, I hope that you, uh, you listen to the music in this movie. Uh, it's not just a time capsule of music, but Spike Lee will often use the dialogue as music. And you'll notice that this film is wall to wall, filled with these songs. It means so much for me, for you to come out on a Saturday night to the Roxy. My name is Jesse Alton Fix. This is Midnight's for Maniacs.